but sometimes it's not the game's fault that it failed. Sometimes it's another game's fault. For example, have you ever gone to a school talent show and saw this really cool performance only for it to be upstaged by the next performance that you completely forgot the one before it? It's kind of like that, and no, I'm totally not repressing bad middle school memories. A return of the belly dance tag, damn it! But seriously, there have been plenty of cases in the industry where a game does nearly everything right, but manages to fail in sales and notoriety just because another game did things just a bit better, appealed to a wider demographic, or had much better PR. And it's a shame too, because each game I'm about to talk about is really good. Some I would even call masterpieces. They just happen to get unlucky. Now, to clarify, I'm not talking about obscure or unpopular hidden gems here. Games like Mad World or Grim Fandango are more cult classics than anything else. Then there are games like Red Steel 2 that are considered good, but ultimately tanked in sales due to other reasons like lack of advertising, inconvenient release date, etc. We're looking at games that did all they could to succeed, but were destined to fail sorely because of another game's success. The more we can directly tie the cause of their failure to the existence of another game, the better. It's a cruel twist of fate, but can't win them all, I guess. Really? This is what we're opening with? You know how much I hate this game! Okami. I think I can put my raging bias to bed for a second to say, yes, this is technically overshadowed. If you need context, I'll concede that this game did a lot of things right, but the things it did wrong just really irritated me to the in 2006, there were two action-adventure games released near the same time. They both featured a wolf protagonist, a focus on puzzle-solving and side-questing, restoring a broken and cursed world to its former beauty, both being released on a transition period between consoles, and a bossy sidekick with the Napoleon Complex. Yeah, the resemblance to Twilight Princess was a wee bit uncanny. And let's not forget that this was one of the most hyped Zelda games in a long time. I know we all love Wind Waker now, but at the time, people weren't happy with it. This was around the time when gamers wanted more dark and edgy stuff, and they wanted a TRUE sequel to Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. So, when you have a game that gamers have been dying to get their hands on, on an exciting brand new console no less, as well as Okami being released on the PS2 when the PS3 just came out, I mean it didn't bomb, but sales were definitely not what Capcom was hoping for. Well, I suppose they could always just re-release it in HD- OH COME ON! Most of the time, you have a game overshadowed by another game from a different company, different creators, or a different system. Or, even if it is by the same company, it's a spiritual sequel or has nothing to do with the game being pushed aside. But poor Shin Megami Tensei got overshadowed by its own spin-off series. Now, Persona didn't come into its prime until Persona 3, and even then it was Persona 4 that really brought the series into the light. And once Persona 4 Golden came out, it was everywhere. Persona even got its own fighting game spin-off, a rhythm game, and do not get me started with the hype Persona 5 generated. This is all well and good, but it's a bit of a shame too, because Shin Megami Tensei is pretty decent in and of itself. In terms of gameplay, Shin Megami Tensei and Persona are practically the same. Dungeon crawling, RPG interface, the use of Personas that are based on mythological and historical figures, for all intents and purposes, they are the same game. However, Shin Megami Tensei tends to delve into more darker tones, with settings that aren't afraid to go apocalyptic, and interactions that really lay in the heavy stuff. However, anyone who has played the games will say that the Shin Megami Tensei games are unforgivable when it comes to their difficulty, and I think that's part of why it was doomed to obscurity. Persona made the gameplay a little more forgiving with less frequent random encounters and a polished gameplay system. Not only that, the characters of Persona are also more relatable. There are people who understand the pressure that Mitsuru goes through as valedictorian, or sympathize with delinquents like Kanji Tatsumi. Or gee, I wonder if people can relate to being an internet-obsessed shut-in like Futaba, but it's kinda hard to relate to characters that have gone through a world-ending crisis. Now, that's not saying that Shin Megami Tensei doesn't have a good plot, it really does, but I feel that Persona has a narrative that just gels with a wider audience. And if you want evidence of this, the latest Shin Megami Tensei game was Shin Megami Tensei Liberation. Anyone remember that? Nope, because you're distracted by high school students in masks dancing to jazz music. Shin Megami Tensei never saw it coming. You know how I mentioned that normally games are overshadowed by others from a different company and that Shin Megami Tensei and Persona were exceptions? 
So is Aiko. Every countdown artist and their mother has talked about Shadow of the Colossus. Most love it, some hate it, but either way, we can't shut up about it for whatever reason. We've dissected the music, the bosses, the motivations, the visuals, the graphics, the heartbreak, but we don't really talk about its predecessor and the company's namesake, Aiko. Why is that? Well, I think the localization had a bit to do with it. The original Giorgio the Chirico inspired box art was certainly eye-catching, but we unlucky North Americans got stuck with this generic steaming pile that looks like the cover for a mediocre action game. I mean, look, he looks like he dove into his dad's costume chest and wanted to play Viking and the lady is half transparent to showcase her as the prize. What were you thinking, localizers? There's also the fact that Aiko as a whole should not work. It's a mostly silent game that's one giant escort mission. Given how gamers were at the time, it was understandable a bit of a turnoff. Man, escort missions are the worst. But once you actually sit down and play it, it works. Ico is a game that thrives in its artistic direction, and something like that was hard to pitch to gamers at the time. Now, I could go on and on about this game's merits, but that's unfortunately off topic. The fact remains that even though the company is named after this game, no one talks about it because they're too distracted by Shadow of the Colossus. It's like someone serves you a great burger, then you come back later and try something else on the menu and get an amazing burger. You're gonna keep going back to that amazing burger. Ah, jeez, now I'm hungry. Something about Ubisoft baffles me. They created this amazingly fun and interestingly designed flagship character, and then they let a bunch of heroin addict bunnies walk all over it. Rayman Legends has become sort of a champion of underdog games in the Wii U era because of its lack of marketing and some poor release choices. Thankfully, the mistakes were rectified and you can still play it and enjoy a good solid game but its predecessor, Rayman Origins, probably deserves a bit more love than it gets, and it came out before Legends was cast aside. But it was going up against the Rabbit. Raving Rabbids Alive and Kicking came out in the same year, and Rabbids Land and Rabbids Rumble came out in 2012. All three of them outperformed Rayman Origins in sales and popularity. Ubisoft even saw the pain of its poor struggling, whatever the heck Rayman is, and offered him mercy. They put him in the 2011 Raving Rabbids Party Collection, and it still didn't help people notice Rayman Origins. How come? It's a great game. The side-scroller platformer is a return to Rayman's origins. I see what you did there, Ubisoft. Stop trying to be clever. With intense and varied level design, bright and smooth graphics, and the familiar quirky sense of humor we've come to expect and enjoy from Rayman games. The plot is simple, but that's all you need from a platformer, and all around, there's a deep sense of nostalgic peace that washes over while you play. But Rayman was competing against his own company, and when you're a silent protagonist up against screaming manic lagomorphs... Boy, comedy sure has come a long way over the years. You know what I strangely miss? More 90s in-your-face stuff from the video game companies. Nowadays, companies are too polite to engage in the fine art of roasting, though we do get a few glorious burns every now and again. The Genesis did have some great games to boast about, and with their flagship franchise Sonic the Hedgehog speeding the way, it looked like they were in a good spot. And they did have a lot of great games. If only they actually advertised them. For some reason, Sega really only cared about Sonic. I mean, he had like seven games. Meanwhile, there was a bountiful harvest of platformers to pick from in the time when platformers were everywhere. Uh, okay, yeah, you can kind of see why. Yeah, the Sega Genesis had a ton of platformers, but for the most part, they were really good. Shoot 'em ups like Vector Man and Gunstar Heroes, wacky titles like Earthworm Jim, platformers that seriously got creative like Pulse Man and Comic Zone, epic quests like Rise Star and Rocket Knight Adventures. Some platformers went crazy with the action like Shinobi and Dynamite Heady. Heck, even a few of the licensed games like Mickey's Castle of Illusion were pretty neat. The Sega Genesis was thriving in cool and creative platformers, so where do they all go? Even non-platformers like Streets of Rage and Altered Beast got lost behind a thick shade of Blue Hedgehog. Literally none of the games we just mentioned have made it to the current generation, and that's a real shame. Meanwhile, Sonic literally ran with his success for the next three decades, to the point where his presence became more and more stale with each installment, and that in turn affected every other Genesis game that shared the same platform. I guess you can have too much of a good thing. when I told you Dynasty Warriors was awesome, but then Hyrule Warriors came out and you all basked in its brilliance! Who's laughing now? <laughs> 
Now you understand. You understand the glory of the Warriors franchise. Gundam, Fire Emblem, Berserk, One Piece, all creative avenues to explore. You all love them so much. You all love them so much. Why y'all ignoring Samurai Warriors? I mean, yeah, it is similar to Dynasty Warriors. I mean, you have a bunch of small kingdoms vying for local power, and Nobunaga is clearly Tsao Tsao, but that's really about it. The characters in this are very different. They still maintain the levels of ham that made Dynasty Warriors popular. Sometimes you like roast, sometimes you like honey hickory, you know? Like, Hideyoshi is two tons of charming ham, but a different kind of ham. One thing people complain about Dynasty Warriors is the retelling of the same story over and over. Well, this game is pretty similar gameplay-wise. If you want something new, try this. Shockingly, Samurai Warriors tells the story of feudal Japan a little more accurately when compared to how Dynasty Warriors portrays the romance of the Three Kingdoms. Though with most Koei games nowadays, a lot of is voiced in Japanese, which oddly makes the ham a little easier to digest, and it follows the campaign of Nobunaga, Hideyoshi, and Takeda pretty closely. All the while, it's basically Dynasty Warriors, but with different characters, and thus different abilities, so there's plenty to experiment with. Quality-wise, Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors are on the same level. But at the same time, that's the problem. You have two games with a similar art style, similar themes, similar gameplay, similar men of ambition. You can get most of the same jollies from playing one or the other. Or you can be like me and just play all of them because you're a sick blind fanboy you can't get enough of ENEMY OFFICER DEFEATED! What can I say, I like pork. It's called a cruel irony. Assassin's Creed took the world by storm with its intriguing premise, fluid acrobatics, historical setting and antagonists, and a penchant for hidden mysticism that left people wanting more. The sequel was arguably leaps and bounds better than its predecessor two years before that had similar assets in its favor. It's almost as if these exact same things captured people's hearts and minds 60 years prior with Prince of Persia's Sands of Time. So, what happened to that series 2010 installment? The problem with Forgotten Sands was that it was a slightly retconny midquel to a story arc that was already completed. I mean, this isn't a terrible starting point, but you certainly aren't going to get people's heads turning with that kind of setup. And let's not forget that this game came off the heels of a failed reboot, so it had that going against it. And as mentioned before, people were getting their platforming in an ancient mystical land starring a snarky prick from Assassin's Creed 2. Even had a debatably more attractive, but far less active romantic interest. The gamers spoke with their wallets, and Prince of Persia fell to the wayside, and Assassin's Creed is now searching for power moons. So sad, the winds of change left it forgotten. <laughs> You know the saying, this town ain't big enough for the two of us? Well, it appears that the town of fast-paced military shooters is only big enough for two. Seeing Call of Duty and Battlefield fight was like watching the old-school Nintendo and Sega brawl, and everyone who tried getting a slice of that money pie got curb stomped in the ensuing chaos. One little engine that thought it could was called Titanfall. It was multiplayer only, and even that didn't work very well, with frequent crashes and terrible matchmaking. It was like playing half a game. Yeah, it worked decently, but if you aren't Call of Duty or Battlefield, Decent is a death sentence. So a few years go by and Titanfall 2's marketing was everywhere. The multiplayer looked fun as well from betas and it seemed like there was a solid success here. Unfortunately, EA and their glorious infinite wisdom, incomprehensible to us mere mortals, decided to release this game in between Call of Duty and Battlefield. It's like they wanted the game to fail commercially. Call of Duty can still coast on that brand name recognition despite the lackluster quality of its more recent outings. Battlefield could as well. Titanfall 2, despite its quality, only had a mediocre first outing to its name. Funnily enough, the general public was still under the impression that Titanfall 2 was an Xbox exclusive, despite being released on the PS4 as well. So, sales tanked and we can chalk up another franchise to EA's horrifically growing body count. We should call somebody. The Final Fantasy franchise is often the first thing that comes to mind when someone brings up the RPG genre. And why not? Final Fantasy has more than earned its reputation. The first game literally saved Square from bankruptcy. Final Fantasy 4 and 6 are still considered some of the greatest games of all time, and Final Fantasy 7 became the most popular in the series thanks to the jump to 3D, lovable characters, balanced gameplay, and a story that was rather unique for your typical JRPG. Well, that's great and all, it caused Final Fantasy to hog all the attention from gamers and left other fantastic RPGs like Legend of Dragoon in the dust. 
Now, you guys have heard me gush about Legend of Dragoon time and time again, and this time is no different, so apologies in advance. It had interesting characters, a unique battle system, and an interesting idea of what dragons should look like. You could play anywhere from 40 to 100 hours because grinding was actually fun. Yeah, there was a lot of bang for your buck. I should mention, however, that Legend of Dragoon did come out two years later than Final Fantasy VII, so it might not be fair to say that it was responsible for its downfall. But keep in mind that Final Fantasy VIII came out on the same year as Legend of Dragoon, and due to Final Fantasy VII's success, everyone naturally gravitated towards the title that had garnered so much success rather than take their chances with a title they had never heard of. That's not to say that Final Fantasy VIII isn't a good game, it is, but I don't think it quite stacks up to Legend of Dragoon and only managed to overshadow it due to the hype Final Fantasy VII generated. So, let's talk about this team-based first-person shooter. It has tons of colorful characters with varied abilities, and encourages players to optimize their party composition for success. It presents polished, balanced gameplay, and embraces fun, color, and humor to an extent gamers haven't seen since Team Fortress 2. The game's world is developed and interesting, incorporating a futuristic setting and a cartoony art style. I am, of course, talking about Battleborn. <laughs> Battleborn unfortunately relied too heavily on gamers playing with their friends, while Overwatch was a lot more accessible. The talent tree system is an awesome design choice, but noobs aren't going to jump into that as easily as pick your character and play. Battleborn was also a lot more difficult if you didn't have cooperative teammates. It also doesn't help that Blizzard knew how adorable and likable Tracer was as their flagship character and pushed her to no end, while Battleborn had no way to compete with that. I don't know what it is with Blizzard, but they seem to understand the principles of PRESENTATION better than everyone else. Battleborn is a lot of fun, and design-wise there's little wrong with it, but it didn't really have the mass appeal that Overwatch had. It's a real shame because if it actually came out later, it might have survived. I'm the Fire Joker, and you know, if games like Paladins are doing alright, maybe Battleborn could have a resurgence. Battleborn Hill? Cut! <laughs> <laughs>